Hello everybody, um, today we're looking at a game played in 2014 at the 41st Olympiad and it's played between Kenny Solomon, our South African GM and a player that no needs no introduction, Hikaru Nakamura and Kenny's just gotten out of a game against Fabiana Kuruana and another strong GM and Hikaru actually he's just drawn against Anish Giri he only had one game before this and therefore it's interesting he's going uh, D5 in a game that he's trying to win against a lower rated opponent so the reason I'm saying this is that after knight c3 c5 we've got the semi tarash position and actually this is known for how drawish it is. Uh, one of the main reasons why it ends up being so drawish is because after c takes d5, knight takes d5, when these two pawns get traded off we have a symmetrical um, pawn structure of both sides and uh, none of the sides have weakened themselves yet. But there aren't any imbalances to start playing for, uh, something different in your position that you can start adjusting and playing and ampl amplifying. It's actually just a very boring game. Um, but Kenny goes for, if he goes if he goes e3, it'll be exactly symmetrical, and trading off this pawn then. But he goes to e4, uh, a more aggressive line, and actually this sets up the first imbalance of the game. Uh, we can see this the difference in the pawn structure. Uh, white have, has the majority on the king side, but black on the queen side. And this is always important to bear in mind. Black trades off this pair of the black pair of bishops uh, so that you can get castled, and that all comes with tempo. Bishop c4, also trying to get castled, and knight d7. Castles, b6, and now Kenny plays rook fe1. And this is something that MVL plays. I actually started looking at what, what Magnus's main line is after this because this is a position that comes up quite often. And it seems like he plays a4. And a4, his idea is to kind of neutralize the tension on the queen side, maybe trade off the pawn as soon as possible, just go a5. Um, and then you can play against one isolated pawn, um, and then maybe try and win that pawn in the endgame and play, play with your majority on uh, in the center. Um, so maybe something like bishop e7, bishop d3, e5. Another main thing Magnus does quite a lot is he waits for black to be the one to resolve the tension in the center before he does anything. So this is why, why queen e3, just waiting around there so that black is the one to capture, which did happen and he went f3 to neutralize the power of the bishop on the diagonal. And this is very key of Magnus' play. Uh, he's making long-term positional advantage for himself uh, in this respect. He did manage to trade off this pawn and then pick up the one isolated pawn on the queen side. And in fact, this was played in 2016, this exact line against Kramnik. Instead, in the game, we've got rook f e1, uh, and this is a different approach to the position. We have bishop b7, and now rook a d1, just centralizing both rooks for now. Um, and rook c8, now you need to move this bishop to d3. Uh, actually, it's also possible to go bishop b3. Uh, this is something that could have maybe been, cons been considered, and I like this move a bit more, uh, keeping your eye on f7, uh, but not a big difference. Uh, we have knight f6 off the bishop uh, d3, and now bishop b1. So this was Kenny's idea with going uh, this way. He wants to keep his bishop on b1, and he kind of gets this idea from a game played, I think, in 2005, uh, where the player left his bishop on b1 and got his queen to uh, h4, and there was always pressure on this h7 square. In fact, maybe a4 would have been a bit more accurate, still going for Magnus' idea. Even allowing this pawn to be doubled, you'll have a long-term target, and then a second one, uh, and then uh, you've got this imbalance you're looking for. Also, just going queen f4, uh, queen c7, now queen h4. There's nothing wrong with just going in this uh, order. Instead, it's just bishop e1, rook e8, and now queen f4. So this is his idea. He's going queen f4. Queen d3 was also a strong possibility. Uh, after knight e7, uh, just developing slowly. Um, remember, when the queen was on d3, he had the... Sorry, let's just go back here. Queen d3. If black is just wasting a move, you can just go uh, e5. And now black needs to be careful because uh, your queen's coming in and the knight's being hit. So there's a bit of a threat coming with queen d3. But all moves are kind of reasonable. Queen f4, queen c7. And now Kenny actually goes in for uh, an idea and he can't really turn back after this. Knight e5. Uh, this wasn't maybe completely necessary. If he wanted to play for the draw, he could have just maybe pushed his queen back and still waited for black to be the one to resolve the tension in the center. Instead, he turns into attack mode. He's going to beat Hikaru Nakamura. Knight e5. This clears the way for his g-pawn. Claims a big central stake. Um, but okay, let's see what happens. Just rook ed8. And now g4. And now 
Hikaru is actually very mysterious. Rook f8. So he's moved the rook all the way here while getting attacked like this. And actually, he's allowing all of this. Um, he wants white to overexpose. And there's actually no clear way forward yet. G5 doesn't do anything yet. So it's simply knight e7. I think even knight e8 is fine. Uh, so just uh, rook c1. Now, since you're going for the attack, you need to start showing uh, why you are doing this. Queen d6 holds onto the spin. There's no moving the knight just yet, unless you're going to one of these squares, uh, which defends the queen. Uh, we had just have rook trades. And now a key point that uh, you need to go rook... Oh, sorry, you can't go rook takes because of g5. And now it removes the defender. Uh, you've removed the defender actually twice <laughs> uh, to pick up that f7 pawn. And uh, white will crush here. So simply just bishop takes c8 instead, keeping the rook on, uh, on f8. And now we have queen e3. We need to come back and defend this pawn. And rook d8, and the point is now that this, this pawn is actually a target. So just uh, rook c1 being tricky. If there's a trade, the piece hangs in the end. So just bishop e7. And now g5. Using this tempo while you can. Knight e8, and now knight f3. So a very instructive uh, play by Kenny there, very accurate. And we have queen e7. And now h3. Kenny plays a very mysterious move. And it took me a while to figure out what he was up to. But it seems like uh, h3 does kind of the same thing as h forward, um, while still holding on to the tempo of still being able to play h4. No idea, maybe if someone else knows better than I do why h3 instead of h4, uh, please let me know. Because the long term ideas are things like queen f4 and bringing the rook to sorry c, uh, c7. And I think maybe the king also just wants to get back of the back rank and maybe you score a tempo, uh, I don't know. But h3, very mysterious move. And I think he also just doesn't want to weaken his position. And just queen b4. And now, okay, this was an important moment for Kenny. He goes queen c3. And uh, if Hikaru wants to trade queens, uh, he can. He can simply just trade queens if he wants to. And then go knight d6. And uh, go after this uh, centralized pawn. And it's actually this type of endgame would... Uh, would suit Hikaru, I think. Where, okay, white does get the 7th rank, but Hikaru can play f6, and these pawns, they're all very isolated. But instead, okay, um, after, uh, sorry, queen takes c3, uh, the, the, he doesn't want to go for this. Okay, so Hikaru doesn't want uh, this draw, so he goes queen a4, which uh, allows bishop c2 with tempo, and now, okay, actually Kenny is is being um, a bit tricky. Uh, he wants Hikaru to take and then go in for a line that walks into kind of a concrete draw, rook a1. And now the point is you need to go rook c8 to hold on to material. And this trades, if you're not careful, don't take the bishop now. The point is that uh, if you take, you've got a lot of, you've got more issues than, than white has and this pawn's also dropping. And finally, the majority is being felt. So this is actually Kenny's very uh, deep idea with bishop c2. Great move. But Hikaru doesn't fall for it. Uh, he simply just throws his queen back. And we have queen d3. And queen d3 is actually the last moment of the game, really. <laughs> it's, it's funny to say so because um, it just feels like, like why? This just looks like an, an, a normal move. Um, in fact, queen e3 would have been better just to keep communication with this rook. If black ever tries playing for the c file, you can simply trade, your queen can take, and um, here is another point, the queen get, goes back to e3, and um, you've helped this trade happen. And in any case, queen d3 actually doesn't communicate with this rook, and then play becomes weak on the c file. So now, uh, knight d6, and it's a small nuance, but now we see Kenny needs to move his queen again. We have rook c8, rook d1, and actually here again, Kenny should have uh, maybe Put his rook on um, e1, rook e1, um, so that after queen c6 hitting the spawn for like a million times, three attackers, uh, you have you have three defenders, and you can simply just move this bishop to d3. But instead, rook d1, and you're not attacking the spawn enough. So after queen c6, you're actually forced to play the move d5. So d5, um, and and here's my point actually that uh, he, Kenny's given up the c file, and now black is actually the one to force white into making some. Uh, 
um, concession in the center being the one to try and resolve this tension first. And d5 actually works quite nicely. Uh, if queen takes, for instance, <laughs> there's this nice tactic and, uh, sorry, why would black do that? Sorry, we'd recapture the queen and then uh, this back rank. So black needs to go uh, king f8 and white is actually pretty fine here um, in this endgame. So obviously the piece isn't hanging, so uh, pawn is first captured and now the, the rook takes d5. And again, this type of thing, queen takes two, two. Actually, this time around, it it favors uh, um, black a bit more. He can go h6 this time around, and the point is uh, that the back rank threat isn't too bad, and the pawn isn't up the board uh, as high anymore. So, uh, but yet again, Hikaru playing super accurately. He doesn't even go for Kenny's tricks. He just goes rook e8. Sorry, after rook takes d5, he goes rook uh, e8, and he's kind of starting to overload. Uh, white's position now. Um, okay, so just queen d3, and now the trades into the end game. Uh, this is kind of forced all of it. A knight e5, and this is this is yet again such an Ikaru position going in for these deep tactics, uh, figuring out that at the end of the day, after all of these trades and queen b2 uh, needed to stop more trades, uh, he can go king c8, and he's walked his king all over to this side of the board, um, and. Um, trust me, he did calculate all of this, f takes e4, and this trade. And actually, it's in this position of the queen g8 check, uh, queen f7, queen e7, and one more check, and the king walks away to safety, that Hikaru is up two pawns after all of that positional play. And that Grandmaster Kenny Solomon throws in the towel, there's not much to do here. And it's actually pretty sad because he played such a deep uh, game, he had such brilliant ideas, uh, deep ideas, Good opening preparation, and Hikaru didn't play for much. He just waited for White to concede a bit too much, and then he got a game. <laughs> so, okay, that, this is sometimes how players win. Um, keep your eye on some concessions that you shouldn't be making, but just both these players calculating very deeply, playing a beautiful game. I hope you enjoyed the game. Um, please remember to... Oh, here's the clock. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and I will see you guys soon for more videos on South African players. Uh, thank you for watching.